the uh, theme of, of team building is one that's pretty close to my heart. You might wonder why. Um, I work at Northern Youth Programs, and every summer we go through a process of, of building a ministry team. I have zero experience in church planting. I will just make you very clear of that up front. So I, while, while I have no experience in church planting, the process of team building um, is, is something that, well, it's just a never-ending job. And it's, it's probably the big job, if there is a big job um, that I have. And so it's something that, I, like I said, I care about. Um, it's not something that is necessarily easy or that comes naturally for me. Um, I would tend to probably naturally be a lone ranger if just left to myself, do my own thing, do what I feel comfortable doing at, by myself. Um, that would probably be my natural bent. I'd like to just help us to see who's around us. How many of you are currently actively involved in a church plant? This is what you are doing right now. So why don't you stand to your feet? All right, and the rest of you, um, you can go ahead and sit down. The rest of you that are thinking about church planting or you're exploring the idea and you, you're wondering what it might be like. Maybe you're taking some active steps, but you're not, you're not really there yet. Can you go ahead and stand? Now, what do those of you that stood the first time, what do you wish you could tell those that are standing now? Go ahead and sit down. That's a question. And I'd like to encourage you to share those things with each other throughout the weekend or throughout this retreat. It might just be what they need to hear. You see, I've, I've kind of given up on some of the fantasies about ministry that I have once entertained. I once thought that it would, like it would be awesome. It's God's good work. And it it will be a wonderful experience, and for sure God would bless us in the endeavors of following him and serving him. I, I once believed that. Now, you might say, well, okay, has Norm become cynical? I, I possibly have. Um, possibly not. Possibly just a bit more realistic. You see, what would... What would the Apostle Paul say about church planting? He would probably say it involves some things like shipwrecks and beatings and stonings and betrayal and difficulty. Just read 1 Corinthians. It tells you all about what he thought about church planting. Words like easy and this will be great are not in the list. Okay. Much of this has to do with how we start and the nature of the work. A survey was done on the most toxic workplace environments. That sounds like quite a miserable survey. But what they discovered is that faith-based ministries were the second most toxic workplace environment. The most toxic environment was the healthcare industry. Now, I would have thought something like coal mining, maybe, maybe like RV factories in northern Indiana where I came from. No, it's faith-based organizations and healthcare industry, the most toxic workplace environments. Why might it be? I think there's some reasons. One is they're both highly relational endeavors. Um, you can beat a lump of coal into submission with a hammer and you can't do that with other people. Okay, so there's certain problems you can solve a certain way. Relationship problems require a different strategy. So on the theme of developing a church, of a, a ministry team, our, our objectives this evening are to develop in our minds a framework for the development of ministry teams. I'd like to talk a little bit the process by which teams develop and also within our minds develop a framework of what is a team and how can, how can this look. I'd like to also talk some practical tools for leaders 
to assist teams in their development. First of all, we should wrestle with the question of why a ministry team. One thing that I admire uh, much about our conservative Anabaptist, well, Anabaptist tradition as a whole is the idea of plural ministry, ministry teams. It just seems like there's much of the Christian life that can't be lived out by ourselves. Much of the Christian life can't be lived out by ourselves. Jesus said in John 17, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe on me through their word. He's talking about us. He says that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may they believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as you have loved me. Now contrast this with a survey that says faith-based organizations are the second most toxic workplace environments where you could get a job. I think we're missing the mark pretty far from what Jesus is talking about and what he prayed to his Father in heaven that we might become. I think we've missed the mark very far, very often, for a survey to be able to produce such results. So let's talk about it. What I've got to share tonight isn't rocket science. In fact, it's, it's terribly simple. And yet, sometimes maybe it's this stuff that we miss that causes us some of the most grief. Okay, equipping the saints for the work of ministry for the building of the body of Christ. When we're talking about a church plant, we're really talking about a group of saints getting together and forming a, a part of the body of Christ. So, the transferable vision, and the reason this is transferable is because it can go from one person to another, to another, to another. Church, the church you attend, and the church you are starting to plant, is there because somebody, or a group of somebody, said, let's start this, and let's do this. And they got the idea from somebody else who had said, let's do this. It can go from person to person to person. And you could, in some way, if you were smart enough and you were enough of a genealogist and enough of a, a spiritual pattern finder, you could trace your spiritual life today back to the Lord Jesus Christ when he started the very first church at Pentecost in, in the book of Acts. It could be done. So it's transferable. The vision for church planting is the vision to plant churches that will plant churches that will plant churches. It's never just to go plant a church. Right, Alan? Right. So how is this done? One thing I'd be pretty excited about seeing here is all the children. Um, most most uh, training seminars or retreats you go to in your life aren't full of grandparents and, and parents and children. One of the key aspects of church planting among conservative Anabaptists has been strong families. And it should be that way. And it should continue. That's not a mistake. That's getting it right. So keep it up. If we don't, if we don't equip our children to plant churches, then what hope will there be for, for their church plants down the road? So children, young people, you've got something to learn here. You know what the biggest thing is you can get to learn here? Get along. All right? That's actually what Jesus said is the most important thing. Get along. And you know what? As, as maybe let, let, you, let you in on a secret. You know what adults' biggest problem is? Getting along. All right. Session's over, okay? <laughs> So equipping individuals to do the task of discipleship so that the team can be built up. When these three priorities are in proper balance, then God-pleasing ministry uh, will begin. In any given ministry team, we have people that tend to 
think more about individuals. We have people that tend to think more about discipleship. We, tend to, we also have people that tend to think more about the group. Well, the reality is, is that we need all the above. We need individuals who are growing. We need individuals who are doing the task of helping others grow. We also need the whole group to get together and get along. It needs to happen. How does ministry happen? Where does it begin? It begins when these three priorities are in some semblance of balance and we minister out of our overflow of these three elements. Team, task, individuals, and individual. When we, when we strive to maintain this balance, then God's goals for ministry are achieved. Often we think of our goals for ministry. I heard many of you share goals tonight, and it's good, it's inspiring. Um, but the question is, what are God's goals for ministry? Ephesians 4 verse 13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What in the world does it mean to become, to have the unity of the faith, to have the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, and to be to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? I think all of us are on a journey towards this, and I don't think any of us are actually there yet. We're all always in process. So maintaining a proper balance of team, of individual, and of the task of discipleship, maintaining this proper balance is always a moving target. It is never, it's, it's like balancing three balls on top of each other in your hand. You just can't, you just can't ever quite get it right to where it's just there and now, now you've done it. Okay. Team, task, individual. Where is your focus? Where is the group's focus? Are we doing well or are we not? Those are the big questions. When we neglect the priority of discipleship, then the task is not happening. The task that is spelled out in Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and make disciples. If we're not making disciples, it's not happening. We might have a group of people. We might have some wonderful individuals. But if discipleship isn't happening, then it's something other than ministry might be a thing, might even be a kind of good thing, but it's not really ministry. If we neglect the priority of unity in diversity, unity in diversity, we like unity a lot, but do we like unity in diversity? Some of us really struggle with that. If it's always my way or the highway, then at some point, the team will fall apart, and it will be really about an individual who is, might be a wonderful individual, and he might be focused on discipleship, but there is no unity of the faith. And so then we miss the first part of Ephesians 4.13. And again, very little ministry actually happens. If we neglect the priority of in increasing each individual's walk with God or improving their walk with God, and we don't care for the individual and where they are and how they're doing, and it's all about the group getting together, and we have wonderful Sunday morning services, we sing nice songs, and, and well, there's people out there doing evangelism work, but within the group itself, well, people are just falling through the cracks, and this person is, well, it just, they just don't matter so much, and we don't care about them. How will, we, how will we maintain ministry? So the first, the first concept in developing a ministry team is for us to understand what we're actually talking about. We're looking to develop a team or a group. We're talking about the task of discipleship, and we're talking about caring for individuals, all three, and having some sense of, of balance in those three. And when those three happen, you've got a ministry team, and, and ministry will happen, and there's going to be an overflow of love, of discipleship, of compassion, 
of honesty and integrity that flows out of that, that lays an awesome foundation uh, for a brand new church. Now, we could stop right there and, and it would sound pretty easy, but this doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen overnight. And so the next, the rest of our evening, we're gonna be talking about the stages of team development. And it's a, it's a bit of a talk about the process by which we get there and the hard work it takes to get there. And we'll be looking at the stages of team development. This is put out by Bruce Tuckman. He developed this model. And I've just seen it over and over. I, I, I think there's many models of team development. Um, however, I've seen this one kind of repeat itself a number of times in my life. There's four stages of team development in this model, the forming stage, the, the storming stage, the norming stage, and the performing stage. And some, some would add an adjourning stage or a reforming stage as a fifth one, which then brings it back around to the first stage. We're just gonna be looking at these four, these four stages. First, some concepts, since it, since it is a model, um, each step builds on the previous one. Each step prepares us for the next stage. It all is about getting to the performing stage. And if we skip any steps, then there's gonna be some negative outcomes. Usually, usually we have to actually live through each step for it to actually get behind us. Whenever a team goes through a shakeup, some new person comes, some, some long time person there leaves and well, it's just different now because of whatever happened, or maybe sometimes there's a crisis event in the team, then sometimes we have to restart with forming, storming, norming, and performing. The goal here is to see yourself on this map. It's like a road map. I, I'm willing to take a long trip and drive if I know how far I am on the journey. But if the goal is just to drive to who knows where, we don't know if we're actually getting there or not, um, we, we can soon become quite disillusioned and frustrated and we can get off the process because we, aban we abandon the process because we don't know where we are in it. And some of you might say, well, I know exactly where I am in this process just by seeing these four words, forming, storming, norming, and performing. And if that's how you're feeling today, then I'm guessing you're in the storming stage because that's the one that most people recognize. And I'd like to tell you right now, I can't fix that but maybe we can talk about it and you can see that you're not the only person there and it's not odd that you're there and that there's a way through it. So that, that would be an answer to prayer. I love this little uh, uh, cartoon. What does MFU two mean on your timeline? Well, that's management foul up number two. It usually happens around the third week, but we don't anticipate any management mistakes. Well, that's MFU one. Um, if you intend to develop a ministry team and you intend it to go well, because like uh, Ernest said, um, these are God's good people, like surely nothing could go wrong. Um, if that's your perspective, well, I'd like to leave you with that perspective, but those of you that know it's not true, then we can keep talking. So let's start with the forming stage. The, the task or the, the main objective of the forming stage is to establish some base level expectations. And it, it, it starts with something like, I heard from uh, uh, Brother Moss saying, our church is full. We've decided not to put an extension or an, an addition on the church. And so we're trying to figure out what church planting looks like. Well, that is very much a forming stage type thing. Somebody's identified that a church plant should happen or it could happen if we got together and talked about it, it might happen. Um, forming, it's an idea. There's a base level of, we could do this. You know, you've already ruled out the addition on the church. Um, so now what? And you'll, in this forming stage, you'll find somebody else who also thinks that way. And Am I right uh, that somebody came with you from Biddinger? Okay, there's two, two families here from Biddinger. So that means there's, a, there's two families here that think the same way. There's, there's some similarities there 
that even if nobody else in Bittinger Mennonite Church says we should do church plants, at least there's two people here that says maybe we should at least think or talk about it. And there's some agreeing on something common, very much a forming stage uh, type, type um, adventure. The forming stage is, is very fun. It is exciting. It is where you hear vision. Uh, you connect with other people that have similar vision. It is like magnets that, that attract each other and, and boom, boom, here we are. And, and some amazing things happen in the forming stage. If you're at it alone and you want to go to a church plant by yourself, you could end up with being in church by yourself in 12 years from now, too. Um, I would recommend that, that a plant um, is, is most likely to be successful if there's at least more than one person involved in it uh, early, in the, early in the process. Because it's in that, in that teamwork of the people that are involved in this ministry adventure or ministry endeavor, it's in their teamwork. That teamwork is what attracts other people who come from their dysfunctional and broken lives. It's what attracts them to the gospel. They, they say, I want to be a part of that. Here are two people that are getting along. I could maybe be the third person and I could get along too. I mean, isn't that kind of appealing compared to the broken chaos you see in the world around you? I think it is. And in that forming stage, you have this, this God-ordained vision and energy that comes. So what do the people need to do in the forming stage? Well, they have to at least exchange phone numbers maybe email addresses, maybe they should talk. They start making contact and they start bonding with each other and they start to develop trust. Now, it's not a tempered and tested trust, but it is a start of developing trust. And one of the characteristics here is that members are often dependent on the primary leader. And who is the leader? Well, the first person that opened their mouth and said, hey, we should, or have you ever thought? That's the leader. It's, it's not necessarily the elected leader. It's just the person that was leading, wherever the idea came from. And the group will be dependent on that person. Some of the characteristics of this forming stage is there's a lot of unanswered questions. Individuals aren't clear on their own roles. And there's always people that come just to see what's being talked about. They don't come to talk about what's being talked about. They come to observe and they're curious. They might be brought into the vision, but they're, they're observers. Everybody is kind of wondering where are we going? There is low trust. And I say low trust, which is different from mistrust. It's just not a tested and developed and solid trust. It's just low. You don't have enough history with each other to trust each other in ways you will 10 years down the road. People are there to check each other out, wonder what he's thinking, wonder what she's thinking. Did you hear what she said? What did he mean by that? That's the forming stage. People aren't really committed to the team. They've, they're, here, they're there because they heard an idea that they liked, very much the forming stage. And we, this sounds like the forming stage isn't all that great, but it really is. It really is an important stage. And all great dreams need to start somewhere. Vision needs to be communicated with others. People need to get behind a vision. If there's no start, there can be no ending. If we have um, a forming stage that is, that is lengthy enough, then you will see who are the people that always have ideas. And there are people like that. There are people that are just idea machines. And God gave them that way, that he made them that way. And they're like initiators. They, they direct a lot of activity. They get a lot of things off the ground. They're intense and excitable people. There, there are people that love ideas just because they heard one. 
and not because it's good, not because they could participate in it, but because they heard one. Did you hear? There is a sale at Walmart on something I absolutely don't need. And yet they will, it, it excites them, right? There's people like that. And, and God wants them in his kingdom too. And he has a role for them there. And, and this forming stage often attracts that type of person. One thing that the, that the intense, excitable people have is they have a short attention span. And so they come to the first meeting and they might be there for the second or the third. And they might forget about it the fourth because somewhere else they heard another good idea. So it's good for the forming stage to at least be long enough that those that get bored real quickly, I'm saying real quickly, um, well, they can go get excited about something else because you're not going to have a successful church plan without also having some people with long-term vision, real stick to it enough, stick to itiveness and dedication and um, very, very slow to abandon something. So don't rush it in the forming stage. That's some practical advice. Okay, the next issue is the storming stage. And why do we say storming stage? Well, it is the stage the disciples were in when they started coming to Jesus and saying like, Lord, like when you get to your kingdom, why don't you remember me? Like, I'd like to sit beside you. That's the storming stage. It's the part of the, of the process where people start to scope each other out and they start to question each other's motives and they, it really is all about power and control. And you might say, well, we're sanctified beyond that. I beg to differ. I have just yet to see a person that really is. I, I know I'm not. In the storming stage, differences in our backgrounds, differences in our culture, differences in our family styles, differences in our values really start to bubble up to the surface. And we start having differences of opinion that matter. And what are we going to do with that? In that process, the, one, of the, one of the main values of the, of the storming stage is it teaches us how to get along with people that think different than us. It also causes us to identify resources, and we'll get, we'll get to that um, in a bit. The behaviors of the storming stage, this is how the people are acting in the storming stage. Um, they express differences of, of opinions. Instead of, instead of all about this new idea that we all agreed on, now it's about all those other things that we haven't talked yet about because we disagree about them. And they're real too. Well, we can say, well, everything that we disagree about doesn't matter. Well, try living life that way. Like just between you and your wife, or between your wife and your husband. I, I, I don't know who I'm talking to here. I mean, in your marriage, try, try, try always agreeing. It won't happen. And if it is, there's something way worse wrong than what we can talk about here. In the storming stage, people start reacting to leadership. Remember I said in the forming stage, everybody's dependent on the primary leader. In the storming stage, people start reacting to the leader. And you start having people in small groups. Say you got 10 people in this, thing, in, this, in this. I call it an adventure because it is an adventure. You have 10 people in this adventure. You will probably have two or three that go off and talk by themselves, among themselves, about what the leader is doing now and how they're just not so sure that he's got their, their good in mind. Like, he didn't think about this, and he didn't talk about that, and he surprised me here, and and, and, and. That's the nature of the storming stage. People become reactive to the leaders. Members become counter-dependent. In other words, yeah, I need help, but not from you. Yeah, that's how people operate. To go from the forming stage to the storming stage, all you have to do is set a mission and a goal all you have to do is say, okay, now let's establish some roles. Let's decide that, that Sam leads the building committee and let's decide that Tony is the best bookkeeper so he should be the treasurer. And let's decide that Mary's on the food committee. And about the time you decide those kinds of things, you probably are ripe for the storming stage. 
You don't really say we're going to go from forming to storming. Nobody actually does that. But you do the kinds of things of setting vision and purpose and putting some things down in concrete. That is a good mechanism by which to enter a storming stage. In this stage, a leader must become somewhat directive and the leader must figure out ways to build trust. We're gonna spend a whole session on trust. That's, that's tomorrow's session. Depending on what type of organization, there should be a reward structure. And the people that are there will need to decide whether or not they actually are on the team. Remember the first stage, there's people that came to look to see what was being talked about. They were just there to scope it out. They weren't sure. Um, a healthy storming stage will fix that. You're either in or out. You're either gonna commit or not. No halfway commitments, because that, that doesn't work. Within the storming stage, you often have a lot of communication breakdowns because you're thinking more about motives than actually listening with your ears. People, people think they hear what they think other people said because they really are feeling with their emotional brain instead of listening and hearing. And this, this uh, little cartoon says, today's topic is communication breakdowns. What did he say? Oh, something about communism breaking down. Well, that's old news. Hey, when wake me up when the meeting's over. What? Meeting's over? Hey, let's get out of here. That's, I mean, that's kind of a, a chintzy um, uh, cartoon about communication breakdowns, but it's about this thing of what people think they hear and what really was said. It'd be a big difference. Many companies experience problems, including a lack of direction, poor accountability, a lack of respect among members, pushing personal agendas, poor communication. This is the nature of the storming stage. In the storming stage, as we live in a storming stage, often this is not just over and done in one night. Um, it forces us to articulate roles and responsibilities, and we actually have to figure out what we mean by what we say. In that process, our own agendas are put on full display and it is really hard to solve problems. Have you ever been in, a, in a, some kind of conflict with your spouse and try to decide what to have for supper? Maybe the conflict was about something else that was very different. Now, and I'll try to decide what your, some, some very small thing, like it actually doesn't matter what you have for supper. You can have hot dogs and it's fine. But if you're having a conflict about, I don't know, maybe about finances, and then, and then the husband says, well, just make hot dogs. Like, think about all the things that the wife could read into that if you said, just have hot dogs, and here we're having a three-month conflict about finances. Well. In the storming stage, that's kind of how it works. People think they hear this, they feel this stuff, splinter groups form, and people start setting boundaries. Well, I'm not gonna talk with you unless so-and-so is there to listen because we need to, we need to sort this out. And it, it becomes very political, very difficult. In the storming stage, there's lots of anxiety. People are afraid of each other. I mean, after all, somebody moved halfway across the state or halfway across the country or halfway across the world to help with this church plant, and now it's not going as well as we thought it would. We thought we knew each other, and we thought we liked each other back when we were in our home church, and we said, let's go do this thing. We were best friends. Remember, we were in high school together, but now it's not that way anymore, and so a lot of anxiety and this anxiety itself can rule, rule the day. In the process, you see people pushing for position and influence. Competition is high. And the characteristic that most defines a team are the cliques within it. This little team spirit. It's not about us. It's about me. Often there's lots of personal attacks. It's about you and what you did wrong. What I don't like about you. 
and what you said that you didn't do. People start to lose trust. Conversations get political. People get guarded. People start looking for ace cards to play on each other, trump cards. If I just do this, then it's going to go my way. Has anybody seen any of this stuff, or am I talking to a group of people that cannot relate? Is this, is this the world you live in, too? Okay, great. Then we're going to keep going. In this stage, communication is a lot less about function, and it's a lot more about position. In other words, it's not about what's right, it's about who's right. It's not about what we're going to do, it's about who we're going to listen to. And it's annoying when you start to see this. Some people stop talking. Some people start shouting. People start avoiding each other. Some people decide never to talk to each other again. It's ugly. In this stage, the storming stage, the nice people, they get up and leave because they're just not going to be a part of this. They're too nice. And if storming gets real bad and you have two or three or four really strong personalities that they just love a good fight. Um, be careful. There's somebody in that group. There's somebody in that mix that does not love a good fight. And they will walk away because they say it's a clown show over there and I'm not going to be a part of it. Tough people they roll up their sleeves and they try harder. And the sly, sneaky people, they run a coup. And they do stuff behind everybody's back. It makes it worse. All in all, godliness disappears. And it's tragic. If you've ever been a leader in a setting like this, you feel like a mistake. You go to bed feeling like a mistake and you wake up in the morning feeling like a mistake and you feel like you'll never be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The truth is, is everybody's making mistakes in this stage. Everybody is. And there's only one way out of it. And that's for everybody to figure that out. You see, getting into the storming stage is about, we started going into the storming stage because we were looking for clarity. We were looking for defined roles. We were looking for clear vision and purpose. We were looking for agreement. And what we just did is we surfaced all the disagreements. They just bubbled to the top. They were there before. We just hadn't talked about them yet. And the storming stage is really important because it actually gets those things up on the table. And if you're scared of storming, you will never get those things up on the table. And you will still be in disagreement. However, it is in this storming stage that most people, that's the most common time when people jump ship or they leave. Say, I've had enough of this. And that's sad. But I'd like to encourage you, there is some real value in the storming stage. First of all, it refines our commitment to the team and the vision. You know, it's quite something to be able to come to a place. You know, you're not born here. Nobody is. But come to a place where you say, you know, brother, I disagree with you, and I love you so much, I'm okay with that. You can disagree about vision even. And you can say, you know what? I wonder if God has placed another vision on your heart so that he can go get that done through you while I carry on with this. You can see this stuff happening in Acts, by the way. So if your church experiences this, then welcome to New Testament Christianity. One of the things that Storming Stage does, it exposes our own selfishness. How many of you are saved? How many of you are still selfish at times? Okay, that's the part I'm talking about. It gives us opportunity for ongoing repentance. You know, the Bible says grow in grace. Why? Why do we need to grow in grace? It's because there's parts of our lives that are just, they're just a little bit too much like us. And we need to have that sanded off. 
one thing that the storming stage does, it, te it teaches us who can be depended on for what. People that will admit their mistakes and surface their weakness and say, you know what, I never was any good at managing money. Well, okay, then why, why are we trying to force you to be the treasurer? Let's just not do that. Maybe, maybe you're an amazing Sunday school teacher. Yeah. Actually, I fit better there. I feel so satisfied when that's what I'm doing. That's much better than everybody walking around and calling the guy a swindler or a thief or whatever else bad thought you had in your mind about this person that couldn't manage the checkbook. Get the people in the right part of the bus. The forming stage is about filling the bus. The storming stage is about getting the people in the right seat on the bus. And no, not everybody fits in every seat. And that's not disrespectful. It's just how it is. The storming stage teaches us to negotiate. It teaches people to, it teaches people to get up and say, you know what? I'm not so good at this. You're better at it. You take it on. It teaches us to communicate with words, sentences, and paragraphs as opposed to grunts, emotions, and thoughts, and feelings. How many times have you felt a certain way, and then when you actually talked with the person about how you felt, you realized you had only a half of the story in your own head, and the story that was inside your head was completely false. And yet we make decisions based on about that story that's in our head, that we told us, that we told ourselves, while we were driving down the road to go get a coffee to cool off. You see, we have to communicate with words, sentences, and paragraphs. And communicating means speaking it, and it means listening it. And that means we gave each other the time it takes for them to say something. The storming stage exposes are the relationally sensitive people, the people whose feelings get hurt very easily, and any good ministry team needs some people like that because they're the ones that are going to notice the neighbor whose, whose puppy got run over on the road and wants flowers because of it. It also teaches us who the very careful, calculating, kind of cold, but very structured people are. It teaches us the value of the whole team, it also teaches us that we can go through a crisis and we can get past it. And man, once you can get past this crisis, you feel like there's nothing you can't do. Like, I mean, at least of the things you should do. It also teaches us to rely on our critics. I, I, I know that I sometimes take my critics way too seriously, but... I think something God is trying to teach me is to actually rely on them, not just put up with them, and, but, but really actually to rely on them. One of the things that happens in the storming stage is the, it's the I told you so people. It's their greatest moment. And it's the people that, you know, well, you should have said something. They actually have a chance to say that in the storming stage. And it's the, well, but you wouldn't listen, people. It's their greatest moment, too. So Really, in a storming stage, like everybody gets a chance in the spotlight. Everybody's right and everybody's wrong all at the same time in the storming stage. Now we need to move on to the norming stage. What does it mean, norming? Well, it means to normalize. Normalize. To make a new normal. Members agree. Hey, that's a novel thought. We can agree on some things. You agree about roles and about processes. Are we actually going to have kids club on Tuesday night or Wednesday night? Well, where I come from, Wednesday nights are for prayer meeting, so you should do kids club on Tuesday nights. Well, but the school has a program Wednesday night. We can't get any children from school on Wednesday night, so we should do, um, you know, we, we need to negotiate. And in the norming stage, you actually have some of this negotiation done, and you agree about some things. In the norming stage, decisions are made through negotiation and consensus building. That means communication. When you have a negotiation and a consensus building, you don't have that much heat or fire. You just, have, you just have people talking and sorting it out and deciding, yep, well, that works for you, that works for me, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. 
in order to go from the storming stage to the norming stage, leaders need to actively support and reinforce team behavior. Hey, I saw you two guys getting along. That was a good thing. And I don't know if you've ever been through a conflict and then saw some, and somebody saw the conflict and somebody saw you doing better than conflict. Um, it can be very encouraging. We all need a bit of encouragement in our good behavior and yeah, create a positive environment. Leaders need to ask for and expect results, recognize team wins. Instead of I got this done, it's we got this done. I, this felt good, we got it done. Again, agreeing on individual roles and responsibilities and buying into objectives and activities. In other words, it becomes now more about what we're doing, not who's doing it. We've got who figured out and the power struggles with the who are behind us. We don't wanna go back to those. Now we're just gonna focus on the mission and vision and that's what we're gonna carry out. To go from the storming stage, we stop and we listen. We take time. We try to create a productive environment. It's a becomes a we can succeed instead of will you help me succeed? It's a we can succeed. Request and accept feedback. Build trust by honoring commitments. I love this, this little cartoon. It says we're communicating better, but we're still not out of the woods. In the norming stage, we remember the conflict and we don't want to go back to it but we're getting along now and we're talking and, and we're agreeing. Some of the characteristics of the norming stage of team development is that we experience success and success is sweet and it's hard, hard earned reward. We see that the team has resources. We see people give appreciation and we see trust starting to build. Purpose is defined. Feedback is high. People talk back and forth to each other. They say, hey, you know, I saw this, right? I like that. Confidence goes up. And when the leader reinforces this, this team behavior, the leader is actually being successful. Some more characteristics of the norming stage is that the members reinforce team norms. The the interesting thing that happens in the norming stage is that new traditions are built and, and new traditions, healthy traditions, or maybe just traditions that don't matter, but man, they're, so, they're still traditions. It's important to develop traditions. I, I remember uh, in our management team at uh, Northern Youth, we went through this probably more than once already. Uh, I know more than once, but one, one particular time I, I remember discovering that the one member of the management team was always sitting in the same chair. And it just clicked in my mind. It's like, this is a new tradition. He now sits in that chair every time when we sit around the table. And it, it's, it's little things like that. Um, I, don't, I don't know what traditions make sense in a church plant um, team, but, but whether it's the guy that always brings smarties and passes out one to each person um, or 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 some funny things like that you you start making well traditions that at the surface don't matter but the fact that there is a healthy tradition means there's a healthy normalizing going on and it's a good thing it's a precious thing team becomes creative new ideas start coming new vision starts to flow and we've gone through this time of muddy water now we're heading down the road together, we're pulling together, and now there's so much more energy for actual ministry because we're not just in conflict with each other. And you can get really excited about new ideas in this stage. The team gains commitment from all members on direction and goals. Remember we started out with somebody having an idea and somebody being willing to listen to it. That's where we were in the forming stage. In the storming stage, every idea got challenged, it got beat up, it got tweaked on, it got worked on, and the ideas that survived the storming stage, man, they're probably worth doing. And we've agreed on them. And now there's this mass team commitment on the vision.
the performing stage. Achieve effective and satisfying results. Members find solutions to problems using appropriate controls. Instead of, instead of it being so much personal, it's uh, often other measurable things that, are, that can be put in place to see, are we actually accomplishing our goals? We said we came to this city to plant a church. Did we plant a church? What's happening in this church? What would make us think that we planted a church? Um, there's, there's ways of knowing. Some behaviors of the performing stage is people work collaboratively. Members care about each other. One of the beautiful things in ministry teams is that we get to not only reach out to the world around us, we also get to reach out to each other. And in the performing stage, like I think in any mature established church, you're very much in a performing stage. You're, you're doing well and people care about the one who lost his brother or his father or um, people care about the one who broke their leg or got sick last week. People care. And it's not, it's not the main focus of the ministry necessarily, but because people care, that's what's happening. And the group establishes a unique identity. We are so-and-so, and it means something. Whatever we call ourselves is really important. And in, in this setting, um, everybody's dependent on everybody else, and everybody's willing to help anybody else. It's not just about the leader. It's not just about any specific person. It's, it's, we're all in this together, and we're about us. That's what we care about, is, is us. To go from norming to performing, we, we want to maintain our traditions. If somebody is always moving the traditions, it's really hard to go from norming to performing. Um, you know, one thing that, that we conservative Anabaptists sometimes we give ourselves a bad rap for, or sometimes people within our groups give us a bad rap for is our traditions. But I, I've come to believe that whatever the traditions are, they have value in and of themselves as traditions, even if we can't draw a clear line from one of the teachings of Christ to certain traditions. Traditions are a good thing. They're a good thing for any people group. I, uh, in Northern Ontario, we work with First Nations people and they have lots of tribal traditions. And, and the healthiest tribal groups are the ones that still have a lot of tribal traditions. I'm not talking about worshiping of some pagan image. That, that's not a healthy tradition. How, how, however, there are many things that are not worship of a false god, and they're merely traditions. It's our way of doing things, whether it's how you plant your potatoes or how you skin your fish. It's our way. And... And every family should have strong traditions. Every church should have strong traditions. It's our way. You know, it's what makes us us. And you can pass those things on to your children, and it helps them form an identity. And it's just a good thing. Good thing. If you want to see chaos, look at a people group that has decided that tradition is a bad idea. That is chaos. In this process, we praise each other, we compliment each other, we love each other, and we give self-evaluation like, you know what, we did, something really went sideways at Sunday school, like what happened? Like nobody talked. What's going on? Well, yeah, the teacher didn't study and the teacher was tired or the teacher had a sick child and Whatever, you self-evaluate, it's not a big deal. You can just do it, you just talk about it. And, and it's not because anybody's mad at anybody, it's just, it's just evaluation. We're figuring out what's going on. In the performing stage, those kinds of conversations are normal and real, good. Leadership roles can be moved around. Obviously, in any church, there is some type of pastoral leadership and some structure with that. I think whatever structure is there is uh, better than no structure. So as long as there's some kind of leadership and, and some things that have been decided upon, um, but, but leaders can, can really divvy out and delegate um, based on who is good at what, and, and a lot can be delegated. 
we share rewards and successes. Um, whenever in the performing stage, whenever we, whenever we win, we win. It's not I win. And communication is continuous. There's almost no reason that groups don't continue, communicate on a, on a very continuous basis with social media and WhatsApp groups and whatever you have. There's ways of staying connected if you want to. Problem is if you don't want to, there aren't enough communication tools in the world to make it work. But if you want to, it can be done. Sharing responsibility, delegating, and committing to the group, committing to the team. It's not committing just to the leader, it's committing to the team, committing to, to, the, to the body. We keep raising the bar to newer and better goals, and we're actually selective on new team members. I, I don't know how this fits in a church. Maybe this, uh, this doesn't work in a church. In a ministry organization where there's an application process and uh, some people that decide who's going to work here and who's not, um, we actually need to be selective. Um, we, we just can't bring in people that have a toxic personality that want to wreck the culture. Uh, we're just not gonna do that. Um, a church, I don't know. I don't know how that's done. I told you in the beginning, I don't know anything about church planting, so I'll just leave that one for, I don't know. Some, some of you that have some gray hair would probably know how to speak to that, um, that issue. <coughs> Characteristics is that the team feels very motivated. Individuals defer to team needs. No surprises. Why are there no surprises? Well, it's because we were communicating. We, want, we don't want to surprise each other. We want to not surprise each other. It's very little waste. It's a very efficient use of, of, of team um, resources. We share things back and forth. We uh, bless each other with whatever we've been given. And we take pleasure in the success of the team. It's a we versus an I orientation. There's a high pride in the team, high openness and support, high trust for everyone, and a high level of empathy or care, and superior um, activity and performance levels. And it's okay to risk confrontation because we just know it's, it's the best for all of us. Remember that the goal is to be here in the performing stage. If you're not there, give yourself time, work towards it, you can get there. Takes dialogue, takes humility, takes brokenness, probably takes repentance on us, on each of our parts. If we're willing to walk the hard path of open dialogue, the hard path of repentance, the hard path of humility, then we can absolutely, everybody here can get to some high level of performance in your church plant. Remember that God is unity in diversity in community for eternity. We get to be a part of that. Now, if that doesn't humble you and make you say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, then uh, maybe you should stick to something other than planting churches. But, but church planting is a sacred calling, and if God has called you to that, then this is what he's called you to. He's called you to join him in the work that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have already in perfect teamwork, in perfect harmony, in perfect unity. They've been engaged in this since the beginning of humanity. And now we get to join him in that. 